А если так? Да. да? Хорошо. Значит, я, наверное, буду сидеть. А то эта штука будет прибегать у меня. Окей. Okay. Welcome to the very first travels with a dilettante. I am the dilettante. Moscow. Um, I am a dilettante for lots of reasons. I'm particularly a dilettante for this uh, talk because I am not an expert about anything that I'll be telling you about either tonight or any of the, any of the other nights. Um, what I am is an interested observer. Um, I have a, a deep interest in Russian culture. I, long, I have had it my entire life. And uh, I've lived here, I've lived in Moscow now for 20 eight years, and uh, in all my time here, I've written 11 books uh, of one kind or another, all of them connected with Russian theater. Um, and a couple of years ago, I began walking out around the city with my camera. This is my camera right here. This is it. And taking pictures of statues, uh, memorial uh, plaques on walls. Uh, sometimes I would do research and I would find something interesting about a building that nobody else seemed to know. Uh, I mean, somebody knows it or otherwise I wouldn't have been able to research it, but it, there was no plaques, no, no sign, no statues, no nothing saying that something interesting had, had, had happened there. And so I started pay, taking pictures of, of uh, buildings like that too. And at a certain point, I began to think, what am I going to do with all these pictures that I'm taking? And a couple of years ago, about three years ago, I guess, um, I started a blog. And I mean, what else do you do this day and age? You start a blog. Everybody, wants, everybody tells me that I should turn it into a book, and I am not going to turn it into a book because it's not a book. It's a blog. When you write a book, you have to answer for what you say. When you write a blog, you can just sit down and hammer something out and just let it go and forget about it, you know, and if there's a mistake in there, somebody writes you a letter and says, hey, you got that wrong, and you say, thank you very much, I appreciate that, and you correct it. Um, I'm not going to write, this is, none of this stuff will ever turn into a book. It will always be a blog. It's a blog I really love, um, and uh, today we are beginning with a building which is right next to this theater. It's 25, Tverskaya Ulitsa. And there's a good reason that I've, I, you're seeing photographs run uh, of this building. I just got put, pulled together all of my photos and I just threw them all on here and we're gonna, I'm just gonna let them run. And uh, maybe every once in a while I'll stop and talk about something specific. But there's a real good reason why I wanna talk about this building. Not only because it's the next building over from the Stanislavski Electro Theater, which is where we are all located. I should also say, in the event that you don't know this, this is being broadcast around the world uh, on, a, on a live stream uh, by HowlRound TV. And so uh, welcome to HowlRound and, and all of you people who are watching on HowlRound. Um, there were 57 people signed up to come tonight and it's rainy today, so not all 57 made it here, but we're here. And uh, 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 we're here at the Stanislavski Electro Theater for one of the evenings that there's evenings go on here at the Stanislavski Electro Theater almost every single night. Lectures, talks, concerts, obviously shows. Tonight it's me talking about a building at 25 Tverskaya Street. And as I began to say, I have a particular interest in this building. Because in this building, for about three years, at least three years, I don't know exactly how many years, but I know it was approximately three years and it probably wasn't much more than three years. One of the people that lived there was the guy that I wrote my very first book about. His name is Nikolai Erdman. Nikolai Erdman uh, is, uh, if you don't know it, was a great Soviet Russian writer. Nikolai Erdman, uh, actually you know much more about Nikolai Erdman than you think you do because most of you young people who, who grew up watching cartoons, uh, almost all of the best cartoons you watched were written by Nikolai Erdman. He wrote the scripts. Uh, he was one of the best script writers for, for cartoons. Um, he also wrote the script to uh, Jolly Fellows, Visiole Ribata. It's a film you know as Visiole Ribata. Good evening, hello. Uh, 
welcome. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote the script to Volga Volga. These are all films that we all watch three times a month on television. They still run today. They were, uh, Jolly Fellows was made in 1933. Uh, actually, 1934 it came out, 34. And it still runs today on television all the time. It's a, it's a cult favorite. It's had films made imitating it and imitations of imitations. It's one of those films that is part of the, the Russian culture. That was written by Nikolai Erdman, the guy that lived here for several years next, next door. But the reason that Nikolai Erdman, the reason I wrote a book about Nikolai Erdman uh, is because he is one of the greatest playwrights of the last century. Uh, he had a difficult life. Uh, he only wrote two major plays. He wrote one play that uh, several of mayor hold staged in 1925 called uh, The Mandate in English or The Warrant. And uh, it was a monstrous success. It was the most popular, the most influential new play written in the Soviet Union since the Soviet Union came into being. And its influence on, on Soviet literature and particularly Soviet theater and Soviet drama was enormous. Uh, and Sevalod Meyerhold, who staged it, uh, wanted to get another play from this guy. And so he immediately commissioned another play uh, this play that he immediately commissioned in, in 1925, shortly within months after the premiere of, of The Warrant, um, this play entered into one of the most difficult fates one could imagine a play could fall into. Because Erdman, as this country changed, the country was becoming uh, much more difficult to, to live in, uh, the, Stalin was, was slowly taking power in the last half of the 20s. Um, there was less and less freedom. There was more and more concern that, uh, of censorship. Uh, lots and lots and lots of people were leaving the country. Nikolai Erdman actually considered leaving at one point. His father was a Baltic German, and so Erdman could easily have gone to uh, Lithuania or, or uh, Latvia or someplace like that. He could easily have gotten out and he considered doing so, but decided not to uh, in the end. And in any case, he signed the contract to write this next play in the summer of 1925. Uh, the first time that a draft came around was 1928. That's three years later. And uh, that's a long time for a play to gestate. It's a very long time. It's very hard. Plays usually, writers like to write plays very quickly. Most of the playwrights I know, and I know a lot of them, they usually close all their doors, close all their windows, turn off all their telephones, or they go out to a dacha with no electricity or anything. Well, electricity, they have a computer, but no telephones or anything. And they sit down in the course of a couple of weeks, maybe a month, they write a play. Uh, the fact that it took Erdman three years to come up with his first draft was a sign of how difficult this play was. And the play, as it turned out, was a play about uh, a young man who is out of work and has no place in the Soviet Union, the new Soviet Union. There is no place for him. And this became a very, this became very controversial. The play was not even finished. It was not staged, but there had been a few readings of it around, and those readings were being attacked in the press. Erdman was being labeled as an anti, as, as uh, anti-revolutionary and anti-Soviet, and the play wasn't even done yet. I mean, it was still being created. This. Uh, hung on for another four years until 1932 uh, when Erdman finally came up with a version that the, uh, the Moscow Art Theater wanted to stage and Meyerhold wanted to stage at, their, at his theater. And they both rehearsed it, but neither one of the theaters could bring the, the play to fruition. It was banned. Uh, Lazar Kaganovich, who was one of Stalin's right-hand men, came to a nighttime showing at Mayer Holtz Theater to pass judgment on the play. Uh, and what he saw did not please him. And he went back to Stalin that night and said, you don't want that play uh, to come to fruition. So the suicide, which Erdman on the peak of success, 1925, huge success with the mandate, uh, the warrant, 
uh, signs a contract with Mayerhold to write another play. This play finally straggles to a dress rehearsal seven years later in his band. A year later, Erdman is arrested. Uh, he was uh, in the town of uh, Gagre, down on the, the Black Sea, and he uh, was there with his co-writer, a friend of his by the name of Vladimir Moss, and uh, they were writing the script together. They were doing the script for Visiola Ribiata, for jo uh, Jolly Fellows, this film that we, I talked about right at the very beginning. And they were arrested, Moss and Erdman were both arrested right there on the set of the film and taken away. Uh, people were absolutely stunned. There's actually, uh, Erdman's father was there, and if you know the film Jolly Fellows, if you've seen it, you've probably seen it a hundred times, but if you, if you remember back, there's an old man in the film uh, particularly in the early th third half of the film, there's an old man uh, who comes in, uh, comes in and out of the, the scenes from time to time. That is Nikolai Erdman's father. Uh, he was a very colorful guy. Everybody loved his accent. He had this very thick German accent. And so all the people in film, actually, uh, Boris Barnett, another filmmaker, uh, also filmed Erdman's father in one of his uh, films. So actually, uh, Nikolai Erdman's father... Uh, Robert Erdman, uh, was in at least two or three major Soviet films with fairly large roles. Anyway, the reason I started talking about him is because there's a fascinating thing that happens with uh, his letters back home. He writes to his very touching letters back to his wife, back to Moscow. Every day he writes back, and he talks about his son Kolya all the time. Kolya this, Kolya that. Kolya... Uh, Kolya came over today for coffee. Kolya was doing this and that and the other thing. Kolya went out to uh, uh, sunbathe with, uh, with uh, Valodya Mas, Vladimir Mas. Uh, every single day, every single day he writes a letter back home, Kolya this, Kolya that. And on the night of the 10th of October, 1933, uh, letter home, he writes, Kolya went out with somebody today in a big car and he hasn't come back yet. I'm sure he'll be back soon. And for 10 days after that, all of the letters home say nothing about Kolya. And the reason is because by that time, that night when he was taken away in that car that his father saw him go drive away in, he was arrested. And they sent him back to Moscow, uh, to Lubyanka. He spent three or four nights in Lubyanka in the, the, uh, the basement of Lubyanka and uh, was kept separate from Vladimir Mas, of course, so that they couldn't, they couldn't talk to each other. And they were both sent into exile within three days. Boom, and he was out of there. Four days ago, he was in Gagri, making Jolly, the, making Jolly Fellows, one of the first great Soviet uh, musical comedies. And within four days, he was on a train heading to Siberia um, a, as an exile. That's where he was, as, as those of us who talk about Erdman and talk about those times, that is what we call the incredibly lucky stroke that Erdman had. The fact that he was arrested in 1933 and not in 1937. If he had been arrested in 1937, chances are extremely good that he would have joined Mandelstam and Kluyev and Meyerhold and all the others who were murdered, who were killed in, in the, uh, the camps or in the Lubyanka. Erdman was fortunate enough, if we can put it that way, and I think we can, was fortunate enough to be arrested four years, three years, before the purges really got going. So he was outside of Moscow. He was in exile. He was in Siberia, a long way away. Um, I don't want to turn this into a, a, a completely an Erdman talk, but I wanted to say all of this because I find it fascinating and I think it's important when we talk about the building next door here at 25 Tverskaya Street, that in this building where there was all of these incredibly famous people that have lived there, the building was built in 1950, I'll talk about the history of the building in a minute, uh, but Maya Plisetskaya lived there, uh, Alexander Deneka, the, the artist, lived there. Uh, several uh, conductors of the Bolshoi Theater lived there. Uh, Sergei Lemeshev, whose plaque you can see behind me right now, uh, one of the great singers in all of the Soviet history, uh, he lived there, and on and on and on. Choreographers, dancers, 
uh, lots of people from the Bolshoi theater lived there. And the fact that Erdman lived there could strike one as uh, being rather strange. How did Erdman, who was an exile, uh, really uh, had no fame anymore because the fame of his first play was long gone uh, by this time. Uh, and as a screenwriter, his name was usually taken out of the, 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 the credits. So when anybody who watched uh, Jolly Fellows after it came out in 1934, anybody who watched uh, uh, that film after 30, when, when Erdman was arrested, until the early 1990s, Erdman's name was not in the credits. Erdman's name was not in the credits of Volga Volga. Another one of, actually Volga Volga was Joseph Stalin's favorite film. Joseph Stalin used to get up in the middle of the night or before going to bed in the, in the early morning, he would call in his, his, uh, the guy who, who uh, showed him films and he would sh watch Volga Volga. He, he, he's, he watched it dozens and dozens of times. Uh, uh, that's another fascinating story and, and it actually touches this building right here. You can see it behind me again, this kind of flesh colored building behind me. Um, uh, we'll t I'll talk more about that too because there is a small connection. Um, so how did Erdman get in there, into this building? Well, let's figure out first of all how the building got here because at the time when Erdman was in his beginning part of his career when he was writing his plays and then writing those first film scripts, there was no such building here. There was an eye hospital on that spot at 25 Tereskaya Street. There was an eye hospital. Uh, all of you people now, you know that you're saying, wait a minute, he's got that wrong. The eye hospital is just down Mamonovsky Piriuluk, just a little bit further. Well, you're right that it, the eye hospital is down there now, but that happened. It was moved. Stalin had that eye hospital, which was an old estate built in 1773. Uh, it used to stand on Tverskaya Street. And in the early 30s, between 33 and 36, when Stalin widened Tverskaya Street, he put that whole hospital on rollers, rolled it 50 meters back down the street, down Mamonovsky Piriuluk, and not only did he do that, but he turned the building around to face the street it was now standing on. So uh, there was this in pretty incredible architectural uh, engineering feat to, to move the, uh, uh, the old eye hospital off of Tverskaya Street and leave a great big hole. Uh, and they started building a, an apartment building. Uh, just down the street, a little further down Tverskaya, or up Tverskaya, I should say, a little up Tverskaya Street, there used to be a church, which was destroyed in 1929. And on the place of that church, it was the church, it's called the Church of the Assumption. Uh, on, in place of that church, a, a, an apartment building was erected in the early 30s. Uh, and the plan was to continue building the, the apartment building all the way down here to what we now call Mamonovsky Piriuluk, which is right here up against the wall of this theater. But what happened was that the construction was delayed and uh, they only got the first half of the building built. Actually, it's about two-thirds of the building. Uh, in fact, let me stop that baby right there. And you can see here... Let me show you. The third of the building, that third of the building uh, was put in where the church used to be. That's where the, the uh, Church of the Assumption was, was, uh, had originally uh, been located. And then this part, that's the part that was not built in time. And when World War II started, it was left. Uh, just, just left a hole. There was just a great big gaping hole there. And so it was not until 1949 that uh, after the war that they finally got, finally got around to, to building the rest of this building. They brought back in the same architect, Andrei Bu uh, Burov. Andrei Burov had designed this building originally and he de designed that first half. And he came back in in 1949 and, and designed the connection of this last third and if you can see here, the three arches, and he put those three arches to connect the two, the, the old part that was built in the 1930s and the, the newer part, which was built in 1949. 
And so uh, that is how this building that we now see when we walk up and down Tverskaya Street, that's where that building came from. Two thirds of it was built in the 1930s uh, in place of a church that had been destroyed. And the other third was built in 1949 to replace an eye hospital that had been pushed down the street uh, on Mamoniski Periulik, about 50 meters. And for those who don't know, and, and for people who are maybe listening in HowlRound, I should point out that this was not the only case by any stretch of the imagination of buildings being moved in order to widen Tverskaya Street. Stalin wanted to widen the entire street. It used to be a fairly narrow, kind of cozy kind of street with churches sticking out into it and buildings sticking out into it. And he wanted to turn it into a more imperial kind of street, the main street that goes uh, down to and away from the Kremlin. And so he had almost all of the buildings on this part of Tverskaya rolled back. This theater that we're located in, the Stanislavski Electro Theater, was also pushed back 30 or 40 meters. And in fact, I've seen them downstairs, the rails that this building was, believe it or not, this building, like, like the, the Ibe Hospital, was put on rails and rolled back, and those rails are still down in the basement of this theater. That's kind of cool, actually. Um, I don't know about the rails at Tversk, uh, 25 Tverskaya Street. Um, so that's how the building came into being. The next thing about this, the building uh, is that it was being built for uh, the people who work at the Bolshoi Theater. It was a Bolshoi Theater co-op. It was a cooperative. And anybody in the entertainment business who was a really famous person had an opportunity to get in and, and, and uh, get in and be, be one of those who would receive these elite apartments. Uh, this, is, this is why when you look at the, the uh, uh, memorial plaques on the building, they all say this person lived here from 1950 until, and then you can pretty much figure out when their death date is because most of them lived here until they died. So somebody was here to, from 1950 until, um, um, 1964 or until 1977 or until 1969, whenever it was when they died. Um, so I, now I come back to the original question is how does Erdman, who is this guy who was in exile, uh, is not by any stretch of the imagination a famous person in the Soviet Union at this point, how does he get into this place? Well, the fact of the matter is that his wife, the, his girlfriend at the time, was a ballerina at the Bolshoi Theater. Uh, Erdman had three wives. They were all dancers. He, uh, Erdman liked dancers. And his first wife was a, uh, was an, a, a variety show dancer that, used, that, that worked at the, uh, the variety theater. Uh, his second wife, uh, Natalia Chidson, with whom he lived here uh, for several years, was a dancer at the Bolshoi. And his third wife was also a dancer. They had been, become involved with one another in the early 40s, Erdman and Natalia Chidson. Her, her father was uh, British, which is why her name is Chidson. It's not a Russian name. Um, and um, they had just kind of been together for almost a decade when they finally decided in 1950 uh, to get married. I don't know whether they decided to get married because it was clear she was going to get an apartment and, and it just it seemed like a good time to get married. I have no idea. Um, I never met Erdman. Erdman died in 1970, so it's not possible. It's, it was not possible for me to talk to him. But I did meet Natalia Chidson and I spent some time in her apartment uh, here in this building. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but they were, they were married in 1950, and they moved into this building like everybody else who moved into this building in 1950. Everybody moved in in 1950. Uh, it's rather interesting that within months of his moving in here, uh, one of his most famous films came out. So he would not have written, he wouldn't have written the script while living here. But while he was living here, uh, a film called uh, Courageous People was released in uh, September of 1950. By this time, he would already have been in the, in the building. 
And for this film, a year later, he was awarded a Stalin Prize second degree. So here's where I come back to Stalin a little bit. Uh, because everybody who was connected to this film, Courageous People, said that they, it, was, it was essentially a request from Stalin that they, this film be made. Stalin wanted this film made about uh, heroic people out in the steppes uh, during, the, during the war. Um, he wanted it to be made uh, a very kind of human kind of story, not, not, the, not the regular heroic story with lots of bombs blowing up and everything, but with a bit of humor and a bit of um, uh, human touch to the whole thing. And if you'll remember, one of Stalin's most beloved films, his favorite film, Volga Volga, was written by Nikolai Erdman. He knew that Erdman would do a good job on this kind of a film, and so it, the, the, the word was put out. It was not a direct request, but it was understood at Moss Film. Everybody that knew about the film knew this at the time. It was understood that Stalin wanted Erdman to write the script for Courageous People. Um, it is also understood, everybody kind of had the sense that this was going, if this worked, it would be really good for everybody involved, meaning this is the kind of film for which someone might receive an award. Uh, and indeed, that did happen. Uh, Erdman uh, and his co-author, he wrote the script with another guy by the name of uh, Mikhail Volpin. Both of them were awarded Stalin Prizes second class. Not first class, but second class. But it's an, it's an important thing because this clearly, was a, there, this clearly was a case of Stalin saying to Erdman, okay, you're forgiven now. You haven't stuck your neck out since you were arrested 30 years, uh, 20 years ago. You haven't done anything, you haven't, you know, you've done nothing to raise any questions, you've done nothing to raise any suspicions, and it was fairly clear that by uh, bestowing the Stalin Prize second class on Erdman, he was saying, okay, you're back in, uh, you're back into things now. This was in 1951. And so that all happened while Erdman was here. So if you figure, when all of the people, all these famous people are moving into this building in 1950, 1951, and Erdman receives a Stalin Prize, he all of a sudden has status um, in, in the society of the time. Um, there is a, a, a slight hitch to all of that, however, and that is that unbeknownst to Erdman at the time, uh, his wife was beginning a relationship with another famous person, by the name of Leonid, um, uh, my mind just blanked, I'm sorry, uh, the, the choreographer, the choreographer, the choreographer, Leonid Lavrovsky, Leonid Lavrovsky. And uh, Lavrovsky uh, lived in a building right across, you probably know this building, it's a huge building right across from the old American embassy uh, on the, the Ring Road. Um, I believe the address is 67 uh, Tchaikovsky Street. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter is, is that Lavrovsky had three Stalin prizes. And I don't know whether that is one of the reasons why Natalia Chitsin uh, found him perhaps in the end uh, um, of more interest than Nikolai Erdman. I don't know, but this was all happening about the same time because Lavrovsky's three Stalin prizes came... Uh, starting in the late 40s up through 1950. Um, and so as Erdman was winning his measly, single, second-class Stalin Prize in 1951, Chidson might have been looking at him and saying, you know, ah, Coley is not as great as I th once thought he was. Um, and in, uh, I, I'm going to jump to one thing because I just love this. I, I think this is a wonderful letter. Erdman wrote wonderful letters. And I'll come back a little bit to their life uh, here in this building. Uh, but I want to jump to the end right away. Uh, and in the summer of 1953, uh, Erdman wrote to his wife, and he had now found out that she was having an affair with Lavrovsky. This is, uh, uh, as I say, in the summer of 1953. And Erdman writes, For Forgive me, Natasha. I've translated this into English. He didn't write it in English. Forgive me, Natasha, but I have gotten so old. He was 53 at the time. Forgive me, Natasha, but I have gotten so old and have become so sclerotic that I simply cannot remember the name of your choreographer. 
It's a shame that for the longest, latest time you have answered, uh, you have answered everything I tried to ask you with silence, or that you have wrapped your responses in such secrecy that I still have no idea of what your plans and intentions are. Whatever they may be, I would be in despair were I inadvertently to force you to change them in any way. I will leave Moscow at the end of August or in early September. I will return shortly in October, in October and then I will leave again. And he writes a little bit about newsy stuff about friends and family. And he finishes the letter, sleep soundly, my sweet. And if I am correct in my assumptions that you prefer to live apart, do live at home, meaning this place right here. Don't forget that we lived together for 12 years and we parted in five minutes. You can't make sense of everything in five minutes. I kiss you, Nikolai. Answer me, please. Uh, her answer was, yes, I do want to live apart. And uh, in, one of the most, uh, in one of the more scandalous, deliciously scandalous events of those years, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, Lavrovsky traded apartments with Erdman. Lavrovsky gave Erdman his apartment across from the American Embassy. Erdman moved there, and Lavrovsky moved into this building here. Uh, the apartment that Cheedson and Erdman occupied was apartment number nine on the sixth floor. You can, if you look from Mamonisky Pirulik from this side of the street, you can look up and you can see the windows. And as I said, I spent some time in there. Uh, I, I interviewed Cheetson a couple of times, and a couple of times I just went to visit her. Um, I can't say that we became friends, but we became friendly. And uh, it was interesting because, you know, she had split from Erdman in 1953. And then when, when Perestroika happened and all of the changes started to happen in the 1990s, every I shouldn't say everybody, but lots of us were, came to Russia interested in Nikolai Erdman. There was a woman from Germany, uh, Andrei Gotsis. Andrei, if you happen to be watching, hello. Um, uh, there were other people doing research on Erdman at the time. And everybody, because Erdman was no longer around, many of the people that Erdman had lived with and worked with were no longer living. People descended upon Nat poor Natasha Chitsin, who had spent 12 years with Erdman, yes, but in the 1940s and early 50s, and this was the 1990s. I mean, she had forgotten about Erdman completely by this time. She had no interest in Nikolai Erdman. And, and uh, I must say that my impression was always that she really never understood who Nikolai Erdman was. She didn't know anything about the suicide or the mandate. She did know that he'd had some play done by mayor hold back in the 20s, but she really didn't know anything about it. She knew nothing about the suicide, and she couldn't have because the suicide had been banned and, and nobody had ever seen or heard it here in, in this country. Uh, only very, very uh, you know, elite writers would get hold of copies and read it. They read it. Writers knew it, but not beyond writers. Film directors would know it. Um, and uh, she knew him as this guy that wrote these film scripts. You know, he wrote scripts for cartoons and he wrote, film, he wrote scripts for other films. But she really didn't, she really didn't understand who she'd been living with. And she was a little bit taken aback when everybody wanted, was descended upon her and wanted to hear her stories. And she really didn't remember much. So she would always start by saying, you know, I really can't tell you much because this was a long time ago. And when he left my life, I basically forgot about him. And uh, one of the reasons, Nikolai Erdman liked his cognac. Uh, he was not a vodka drinker like most Russian writers are. He was a cognac drinker because he wasn't entirely Russian. As I said, he's, uh, his father was uh, 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 of German heritage. So he was half German. And uh, he enjoyed his cognac and he... Uh, often would get together with other writers. He and Alesha would get together, Platonov. They would hang out, by the way, down at another building at the other end of this, almost at the other end of Tverskaya, uh, the, the National Hotel. They would get together and hang out. And uh, they would uh, drink and talk. Uh, nobody knows about what, because nobody ever got a chance to ask them. At least nobody like myself who would have, who would have cared to have written it down and remembered it. Uh, anybody else you ask that knew about it would say, I don't remember. I talked to Josef Prut, who was a, a playwright, uh, 
uh, a couple of times, and he was a good friend of Erdman's uh, from his childhood. They grew up together, and, and they used to get in street fights together. But he would be at, he was at some of those meetings where Alesha and uh, Platonov and Erdman would hang out, and he all he could tell me was the only thing I can tell you is that they never talked about literature. So uh, beyond that, I can't tell you what they would talk about. But some of his other friends were a little more insistent. Uh, he was a very good friend of Alexei Diki, the actor and director. And Diki was quite a drinker. Um, and uh, the very last time I uh, spent some time in this uh, building would have been 1995, uh, when Natalia Chitsin was still alive. Um, I went to see her to give her a copy of the book that I'd written. Uh, based uh, in, in small part on, on stuff that she had told me. Um, but she uh, told me that day, as I was leaving actually, I'd come in and we'd just been chatting. And as I was on my way out, uh, we were standing in the, the entryway to the apartment and she said, you know, maybe one of the reasons I really don't remember that much about Nikolai is that he really infuriated me sometimes. And his friends would infuriate me because we would be asleep three in the morning and somebody would start banging on the door. And she said, you have to remember, this was in the 1950s, you have to remember, Nikolai had been arrested, Nikolai had been in exile. And when people started banging on your door at two or three in the morning, it could be very frightening. And I would say to Kolya, don't get up, don't get up, don't answer the door. And he would usually get up and he would go and he'd answer the door. It would be Alexei Diki and a couple of other actors who had had too much to drink and they'd come over to Kolya's because they knew that he had cognac, at least. He might not have vodka, but he'd have cognac. So he'd, they'd, they'd come rolling into the apartment. Of course, Kolya couldn't kick them out. They'd he'd show them in and they'd sit and they'd sit until the, the morning. And this may be one of the reasons why Chitsin was so happy. I don't know whether Lavrovsky, the, to whom she went when she left Erdman, I don't know uh, what kind of a drinker he was, but if you can imagine if you had to put up with that kind of stuff very long, you might in fact find somebody else to replace, to replace this guy and tell him to go home or go somewhere, not home, go somewhere else. Um, another thing I want to mention because, it, you know, these are just little, these are small little personal touches uh, and they're the kinds of things that, that are the reason I write this blog that, that, that actually has given rise now to these talks that I'll be doing here at the theater. Um, that last time I was in the apartment that Erdman had been in, uh, Cheatson once again kind of walked me around and she showed me the sofa. There was a oh, very old sofa, uh, very old, very kind of hard, flat, but very stately looking sofa, very wide. Uh, not at all the kind of sofa that we that uh, we see in houses these days. S certainly, you would never find anything like it in IKEA. Um, and uh, she told me then, and I hadn't known this, that this was Nikolai's father's sofa. I mean, it was the sofa they had had when Kolya was a little boy growing up, and it came to Kolya when they moved into this apartment. Uh, uh, he brought this sofa with him. And that first year that they lived in this building, uh, Nikolai's father, Robert, who, who I'm gonna remind you again, who, who played a, a fairly large role in The Jolly Fellows and played a, a very large role, played a leading role in one of uh, Boris Barnett's films in 1932. Um, he died in this room, in this apartment, on that sofa. Um, and, and so there is this kind of you know, you stand there in a room and you're looking for reasons. If you're like myself, uh, I'm Nikolai Erdman's biographer. So I'm looking for reasons, I'm looking for, not reasons, I'm looking for ways to get inside of this story that I'm trying to tell. Uh, you're, looking for, you're looking for things that can give you a personal connection that go beyond the dates and go beyond the names. And you stand there and you're looking at this sofa that is really wide and hard and very old and obviously old. And you know that when Kolya was a little kid, he had probably had trouble jumping up on it because it was his dad's sofa, probably brought from uh, the Baltic states. 
and that it came into this place when Erdman moved here in 1950, and then that year when his father died, he was lying on this sofa and he died there. And, and that's one of those moments where there's a little bit of a connection that happens, you know? And it goes beyond the stuff that people tell you, and it goes beyond all kinds of things. And all of a sudden, something happens, and you go, hmm, I just, I just kind of made connection with this thing that I'm trying to do. But I must say that the biggest one, the biggest, the one that had the biggest effect on me, and she had never told me this before when I'd been there, she told me just this one time, because the, about the sofa, she had talked about that from time to time. The, she says, look at this plant on the windowsill. And there was one of these, those cactuses that every one of us has. I mean, we all have this cactus. It's that thing where the, you know, a new thing grows out of the old one and they just grow like crazy. And I, they're in every single house I've ever been in in, in Russia. We have one. Uh, and it was this huge cactus on this, uh, this windowsill that looks out onto the Stanislavski Theater from the side here and looks out onto Tews, the, the Moscow Young Spectator Theater. And she said, that's Kolya's. She said, that plant was Kolya's. When Kolya came, he came with the sofa and that plant. And if the sofa was cool, and the sofa was cool, but the plant was a living thing, <laughs> you know? It, I mean, the plant was still alive. When I was standing there in 1995, uh, and it had been alive, Nikolai Erdman had watered that plant, of course, you know? And, and I was standing there looking at the plant, and there were probably cells in that plant that were still, you know, left over from then. I, I can't say, it doesn't, it doesn't go as far as, you know, like chills down the spine, unfortunately, it doesn't quite go that far, but I must say that that's one of those moments when I made a connection, when I felt as though I was connecting, really connected uh, to the man about whom I was writing, who I'd written by that time, who I'd written a book about. Um, I will say that I actually felt very strong contact with him all the time when I was reading his works through his literature. I made, that's where, that's where the chills came down the spine, I was sitting up in, at three or four in the morning with my uh, young, my then uh, new wife, and she would be reading this stuff to me, and we would be laughing and howling and talking about it, and making connections. Uh, this incredible writer. Um, that's where this. That's where the chills came down the spine. But that that plant, that cactus plant, I'll never forget the cactus plant. The cactus plant was a very cool thing. Um, some of the other people, does, does somebody have a watch or a, 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 a telephone? I turned my phone off because so, I didn't want it to ring. What, uh, Kost, uh, is not here. Ребята, скажите, пожалуйста, сколько времени сейчас? Скажите, сколько времени? It's 10 to 8. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I just did some writing about uh, uh, Emil Gilles, uh, who also lived here in this building. And I found a, a couple of interesting things. There was also an interesting personal thing, too. And, and, and let me start with the personal thing, uh, a connection to Gilles. It's not a, it's not a direct connection to Gilles. But uh, Emil Gilles, uh, as you all know, was one of the great musicians of the 20th century, one of the great pianists in the history of the Soviet Union. Um, I didn't know that. I was an American kid. I, was my, I listened to rock and roll, and, and uh, I didn't know anything about classical music. Uh, I'm talking now about back in uh, 19, 19, 1980, 19, 1980, 81, 82, uh, back in there, and I lived in Washington, D.C. And um, uh, I had been sneaking copies of Nikolai Erdman's The Suicide, which was this band play that we've talked about, right? I'd been sneaking copies of that into a friend of mine who was a, th a theater director in Leningrad. By, uh, it was, the play of Suicide was still unpublished in, in the Soviet Union at that time. And uh, my friend Volodya uh, wanted to read it. He'd never been able to find it. He'd never read it. So what I did is I Xeroxed the whole play. And then on the back side of the pages, I would write letters to my friend Volodya. And there would be, uh, and so I'd write him a two-page letter, 
And so page one and two of the suicide would be on the back side, and my letters would be on the, the first side. And then a, a week or two later, I would write him another letter of a page or two or three. And little by little, I was sent, basically I was sending the suicide to my friend Volodya Firkilman, who lived in, Saint, in Leningrad. And uh, I would get letters back, and he was very careful, but he was letting me know. He says, things are working really well. You know, I've read up to page 40. There was 83 pages in this edition that I had. And, um, and then at a certain point, he wrote back and says, hmm, the reading, hasn't, the reading has stopped. He said, I haven't been able to get past, get, get past page 40. And I understood that it had been intercepted, and they had found, and they were not letting the letters through. Well, a couple of days later, a couple of weeks, maybe weeks, months, shortly after, let's put it that way, I worked in a bookstore, and a couple of months later, a man came into the bookstore looking for a map of Moscow. It was a very strange thing to come into a bookstore in Washington, D.C. for. And I'm going to make a very long story short because we're talking about the building at 25 Third Sky Street. But this is, this, there's a connection with Gilles here, you see. Uh, this guy turned out to be a KGB agent who found me because I was sending all of these letters from the bookstore where I worked. So the, the return address, the return address of where I worked was on every single letter I sent. <laughs> so it was pretty clear how they found where to find me, and they just came looking for me, not looking for a map of the Moscow Metro, of course, although I didn't realize that quite at first. It was when the, it was when the FBI began contacting me that they explained to me what was going on. This, this was a crazy time in my life. I had the, I was, for two years, I had the KGB on one side and the FBI on the other. I must tell you, I don't care really very much for either one of them. Um, but in any case, uh, we were talking one day, I was talking one day to this guy from the, the KGB agent, and uh, he was telling me about having just accompanied Emil Gilios uh, on a tour. And clearly my face was blank. Emil Gilios didn't mean anything to me. If he'd said Bob Dylan or if he'd said the Rolling Stones, I would have gone, wow, really? You know, I would have done that. But he said Emil Gilios, and I thought, I don't know who Emil Gilios is. And he says, Emil Gilios is one of the great pianists of all time. He said he's my favorite pianist, and I want you to remember that. Actually, I was very good friends with this guy. He was a, he was a nice enough guy. Uh, we'll talk about him some other time. But that was my very first exposure to Emil Gilios was he was the favorite pianist of the KGB agent who found me in, in Washington, D.C. because I was sending copies of The Suicide from my place of work at the bookstore in Washington, D.C. to my friend in Leningrad. And when I came to, when I came to uh, it was still the Soviet Union when I came here in the late 80s, and I saw, and I went to find this building where Nik Nikolai Erdman had, had lived, and on the walls is a plaque that Emil Gilios had lived in this building. I thought, oh no, you can't do this to me. It's way too much. You know, the connections of, of life and the way that things happen is just a little bit too strange. But anyway, so there's my little story of connecting, uh, not connecting me to Emil Gilios, but connecting a, 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 a person I once knew to him and a very strange convoluted connection back to Erdman and they both come together at this building. Emil Gilios also moved into this building in 1950, and he lived here, he lived here until uh, he died in 1985. But there's a couple of the really interesting connections in terms of years. Um, uh, I talked about the fact that part of the building, the, 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 the northern part of the building, two-thirds of it, uh, were built in place of a church that had been torn down in 1929. Okay. 1929. Well, Emil Gilios uh, made his very first public appearance as a pianist in 1929. So Emil Gilios was down in his hometown of Odessa, and for his very first time, he walked out on a professional stage and gave his very first performance, 1929, just as part of the, uh, uh, the building that he would end up living in 20-some uh, years later was actually being prepared because one part was being torn down. I mean, uh, one building was being port torn down so they could build another part. He won his very first award, Gilios won his very first award as a pianist in 1933. Well, 1933 was the year that they began to widen Tverskaya Street. Uh, and of course, by widening Tverskaya Street, we, they, had, they had to go through all of the convolutions that I told you about, which brought 
brings it, which bring us to the building that stands there today. Just a small connection, but an interesting one. He moved into the building in 1950. And in that very year, in 1950, he formed a trio with Leonid Kogan and Mstislav Rostropovich, which is considered one of the great classical trios ever to have existed. Uh, the recordings of these three men together uh, are, are absolute gold. Uh, I've done, I did a little bit of research. I mean, it's armchair research, but I did do a little bit of armchair research. Um, and uh, I, I found one Western critic uh, who said that he'd probably never heard any three musicians play together better than these three did together. They didn't, they didn't stay, well, they stayed together almost a decade, um, and they ended up breaking up, apparently, at least one of the reasons for it, was that Leonid Kogan was a, a more conservative, politically conservative, Mr. Slav Rostropovich was more, shall we say, progressive, and Rostropovich and Kogan simply could not get along. Um, and uh, so they, they, that ended up breaking up the trio. But while Gilios was living here, he was the uh, very first Soviet musician ever to play the Zal Playel, the famous Zal Playel in Paris. It's a, one of the great concert halls of the world now. Uh, as a resident of this street, of this, as a neighbor of, of ours here at the Stanislavski Electro Theater, uh, Gilios went and performed at Zal Playel in 54. The next year, in 1955, uh, Gilios became the very first Soviet musician ever to tour the United States. Um, he played uh, Carnegie Hall and he played uh, the, with the Philadelphia Philharmon Philharmonic with Eugene Ormandy. But uh, all of that was taking place while he lived here at this building at 25 Tverskaya Street. A couple of other people uh, who I'll just kind of mention a few, and then, and then we can talk. I can, if you have questions about anything, about this topic or anything else, we can pick them up. But um, as I pointed out, Sergei Lemeshev was, was uh, one of the great Soviet uh, tenors. In fact, he's, he's considered a lyric tenor. I thought that was interesting. I, I, frankly, I didn't know that as a term. But when I was looking up some, some information about him, I found that he's, Sergei Lemeshev is considered a lyric tenor. And I asked my wife about him, uh, my wife, Oksana Muisina, um, about him this morning. And she says, oh, my God, because I, I really I told you, if you talked about Bob Dylan or the Rolling Stones, I know a lot. If you talk about classical music, I'm not quite as knowledgeable. And Oksana, I had jotted down a couple of her comments. First of all, she says, oh my God, John, you, you have to know Sergei Lemeshev. That was the first thing she said. Second was, she says, oh, of course, he was one of the greatest. Shalyapin, Lemeshev, uh, he was handsome. This is my, my, uh, my wife responding immediately to things that are important. He was handsome, blonde, women went crazy over him. Uh, he had a very thin, high voice, she said, very emotional. That's another thing that's very important with Oksana. Uh, you need to be emotional uh, for Oksana to be interested in you. He was uh, as popular in opera as Leonid Utyosov was in jazz, she said. Now, this is not uh, encyclopedia stuff, but this is the reaction of my wife, who is a very cultured person. She's an actress, a very good actress herself. She knows music. She's, she studied at the um, she studied violin at the Gnesin College, and, and so she knows what she's talking about. Um, so that's her stamp of, Oksana Muisina's stamp of approval on Sergei Lemeshev. While he lived here, by the way, while Lemeshev lived here at this building, he taught at Moscow Conservatory. He debuted as an opera director in 1951, a year after he came here. Uh, he staged uh, Traviata in Leningrad. And in 1957, while still living here, he uh, directed Masne's Werther, at uh, the Bolshoi Theater. That was his debut as a director of opera. That all happened here. Um, Alexander Deneka, one of the great Soviet painters and artists, um, lived here from 1951. He moved in a year late. I don't know why, what happened, why he was so. Everybody else moved in in 1950. He came in in 51, and he was here until 1969 when he died. Um, he is known, of course, as a monumental artist. He, monstrous paintings uh, of uh, industrial, often industrial or military uh, 
uh, topics, but not only. Um, some, of his, some of his most painous, famous paintings were painted while he was here. Um, a Fisherman by the Sea in 1956, Military Moscow in 1959, uh, the painting in Sevastopol in 1959. They were all done while he was living here in this building right next to us, which I think is very cool. Another person that I found out just recently who lived here was Maya Plisetskaya, who died a year ago. Uh, and I found out about this because somebody saw a, a, bl a, a blog that I did. I did the blog about Erdman having lived at this building. Uh, no, actually, I wrote a blog about Deneka. No, I didn't. It was the Emil Gillils one. It was the Emil Gillils blog just recently. Somebody saw it on the internet, and they wrote me on Facebook and said, uh, my husband was born there and grew up there. He can tell you all kinds of things about this building. And I think I may actually contact this guy and try to get some more information about it. I am now very interested in this building. But among other things, she said one of the people that lived there was Maya Plisetskaya, and I did not know that. There is no plaque there, of course, yet. Um, I would presume that there will be one day, but there is not yet. She's only, she only left us about a year ago. But I did find this little tidbit, which connects her to Chidson, Erdman's second wife, uh, from her mem from uh, Plisetskaya's memoirs. And I didn't uh, translate this, so you will have to pardon me. I'm just going to kind of translate as I, as I go. Um, but she was writing about uh, the other dancers at the Bolshoi Theater. And she said that Galina Ulanova and Olga Lepishinskaya, of course, two great dancers, you know that. Anybody watching uh, on camera may not know that. So let me say that Galina Ulanova and Olga Lepishinskaya are two of the great uh, Soviet ballerinas. Galina Ulanova and, Le and Olga Lepishinskaya would uh, get dressed in their very large, spacious uh, dressing room in the Benoir. Aside from them, that room was occupied by Tina Galetskaya, Chidsen, she just says Chidsen, Lu, uh, Lulia Cherkasova, and Yelena Mikhailovna Ilyushinka. Throughout the, the, throughout the theater, this dressing room was called the Snake Pit. Uh, this is where people went to have evil done and we'll just leave it at that. Um, so Plisetskaya's attitude towards this dressing room, at least at the Bolshoi, which was occupied in part by Natalia Chitsin, who lived here with Nikolai Erdman, um, and then later with Leonid Lavrovsky, uh, was, she was part of what Maya Plisetska, in any case, uh, called the snake pit at the Bolshoi theater. Another little very small connection uh, I, uh, I wrote a play a couple of years ago in which uh, Maya Plisetska was is a character who kind of she's not she's not actually a character in the play but she is a figure in the play who figures from the from the beginning all the way through to the end. Um, and when I wrote that play and used Plisetska as a figure in the play, I had no idea that she had lived in the building that Nikolai Erdman lived in where Gilios lived and all of these things that once again seem to connect us. Um, she, uh, Plisetskaya lived basically to, towards the end of her life after 1990, she essentially left Russia. She lived mostly in Germany, but she also lived a little bit in uh, Vilnius, uh, in Lithuania in any case. But she always kept the apartment here and whenever she would come back to Moscow, she would stay at this apartment here, and she was in apartment number 31. Nikolai Erdman and his wife Natalia Chitsin occupied apartment number nine. So uh, those are a few little details connected uh, with the building at 25 Tverskaya Street. Um, and uh, I would like to if, have you ask any questions you would have. I, I, I hope I, I'm going to repeat once again that I, I'm not standing here as an expert. I'm standing here, here as an interested person. So I do not have a whole bunch of answers about 25 Tverskaya Street, but I'm willing to try to answer any questions if you have any.
And uh, if you have questions about anything else, I'd be willing to answer uh, questions about that too. Does anybody, does anybody have any connection with uh, this? No, no. Um, I want to point out for people that, you, again, once again, this is something you all know and, and, and nobody else really does who's watching on, on camera at this point. Um, but I've talked several times this evening about how Stalin widened Tverskaya Street in between 1933 and 1936. And of course, our uh, marvelous mayor, Sergei Sabyanin now is destroying Tverskaya Street entirely and narrowing it back down. Um, it's uh, sometimes one wonders uh, how decisions are made, why they're made, and one wonders why anyone ever bothers to make a decision when 60 years later somebody's just going to turn it around and do the opposite anyway. So uh, I, I understand that, uh, that uh, Sabyanin's idea is to make the, the sidewalks very large and to have places for bicycle lanes and to have benches and, and trees. And one does hope that Tverskaya will look better than it does right now. But I do find it ironic that Stalin ripped this place to shreds in order to widen the street and Sergei Sabyanin, uh, 70, 85 years later, comes along and he tears everything to shreds in order to narrow the street back down. So there you have a little bit of, I mean, that's even a little bit of wisdom. I mean, I haven't, I haven't, somehow I haven't come up with anything wise to say tonight, but uh, I think there was a little bit of wisdom in that. You know, you, <laughs> things, things that go around come around. There's a phrase in English like that, that fits. No questions? Then, in that case, then, yes, 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 please. Well, when did you decide to write a book about Why did I decide to write a book about Erdman? Really good question. It's a, it's a, let's try to make this answer as short as possible and as entertaining as possible. Uh, the way I tell the story is this. I had just graduated from college. Uh, this was in 1980. I graduated from college, the University of California at Irvine. And as I liked, I graduated with a degree in Russian literature. So, you know, I had this piece of paper called a diploma on which it was written that John Friedman knows everything there is to know about Russian theater because John Friedman has just been issued a baccalaureate award, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there I was knowing everything there was to know about Russian literature. And I was in Boston at the time, and I pick up the newspaper, and there is a review of this unbelievable new play by this Soviet playwright, Nikolai Erdman. And it says, this guy is one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, and his play is one of the masterpieces of the 20th century. And I looked at that review, and I thought, I've never heard of Nikolai Erdman. How could he be so great? Because I know everything there is to know about Russian literature. So. I went and I bought myself a, a, a ticket to this show, which was in Providence, Rhode Island. It was about an hour's drive from Boston. And I drove down to Providence, Rhode Island. It was the Trinity to Square Repertory Company, is the name of the theater. Uh, for the people interested in connections, a very good friend of mine is now the artistic director at the Trinity Square Repertory Company, a guy I met in Chicago many years ago. <laughs> the, I find this incredible. Um, but went to the Trinity Square Repertory Company and I sat down front row center to watch this production of The Suicide by Nikolai Erdman, whom I'd never, about whom I'd never heard anything, staged by a guy I knew nothing about, Jonas Yerashis. Uh, Jonas Yerashis is a fascinating guy in himself. He had staged a version of Macbeth at the Sevremenik Theater in the 70s, around 76, and it had been banned. They shut it down. And he went into exile, and this was one of his first productions after having gone into exile in the West, and he staged the suicide. And I don't remember ever laughing so hard, you know, for three hours. I sat there, and I and the rest of the people in the audience, however ma ever many there were, uh, we just howled and howled and howled for three hours. And I drove home to Boston feeling I could sense it. You know, you, you sense things in, this, in, in your life. Yeah, I, I drove home 
with this sense that something in my life had changed. I had, something was different. I mean, I really did feel that. And, and the next, very next day, I went to the library. I mean, I was just working. I was working in a basement in a, in a, in a store. Uh, I, I wasn't, I was just, you know, I was just a kid. I was just, I wasn't, didn't have any idea what I was going to do with myself. But when I wasn't working in the store, I would go into these libraries and I would look for stuff about Nikolai Erdman. I could find nothing about Nikolai Erdman. There was nothing there. And it so happened I got married and we went to Washington. My wife, the, my first wife, worked at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., which meant I was able to get into the stacks. I was able to get back into the library at the Library of Congress, which is like one of the two or three greatest libraries on planet Earth. And I could just go. I, nobody else, you can't just go into the Library of Congress. You have to get a card and you have to order books, you know, and they bring them to you. You don't get to go back and look through the books. I, because I had a wife who worked there, was able to get back there. And I would walk, I would just go down the line, pulling book after book after book out. And I, I've gotten to the point where now uh, I can pick up a book and I can just flip through it and I will see everywhere where Erdman shows up. Because that, that, that eh, the letter eh for Erdman is, is really fat and it sticks out. And my eye, have an eye for it. So I can flip through a book and I can see it. And so I just started, you know, I was, I was just working. I was, I, I, this, by the, in D.C., I was working at the bookstore that I talked about. And uh, I just became very interested uh, in this guy. And at a certain point, I thought, you know, somebody has to write about this guy. This guy is incredibly good. And somebody has to write about him. And, you know, what you do in life is these things happen to you a couple of times. They ha it happens three or four or five times in your life when you say somebody has to do that and you think, well, who could do that? And then all of a sudden you go, oh, I could do that. <laughs> and so I went back, to, I en en enrolled in graduate school in Washington at George Washington University and I did re research on Erdman and wrote a, a master's thesis. And then I applied to graduate school in, at Harvard. I went to do my PhD, my doctorate at Harvard, and I wrote my dissertation about Erdman at Harvard. And when I, I came here to do research for my dissertation, and I met the woman, Oksana Muisina, who became my second wife, and I stayed, and I wrote the book about Erdman, and I wrote the first the dissertation, and then I wrote the book about him. Um, so. It all started, you know, when I was very stupid and didn't know anything, and I read a review in a, piece, in a newspaper, and, and I thought, gosh, I have to go see what that's about. That's how it started. Yeah. So you have no idea Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's two reasons I live, well, three re there's three reasons I live in Moscow. There's three reasons. One is Leo Tolstoy, the other is Nikolai Erdman, and the other is Oksana Moisina. There's no other reason for me to be in this city. Those are, those, th but those are three really big, really good reasons. <laughs> I read Leo Tolstoy, I read War and Peace when I was in high school. Uh, and uh, it, that changed my life forever. The way, the way my life changed going home after having seen the suicide. My life was changed by War and Peace. I read that book and realized I have to have more of that. I have to have more of that. I read Tolstoy. I read all of Tolstoy. And then I read all of Dostoevsky. And I read all of Gogol. And I, I mean, I read all of Nikolai Chernyshevsky. I read everything, you know, until, again, I, th I thought at a certain point, I have to do something with this. I'm reading these things all the time for years and years. I spent years reading all these things, I just, just reading them. And then I decided, well, I have to go do something with that. So I, I entered, I went to school. I, I enrolled in college, and I got uh, that that piece of paper that told me that I know everything there is to know about Russian literature that I mentioned five minutes ago. So, yeah. So Tolstoy, Nikolai Erdman, and Oksana Mysina, the three reasons I live in Moscow. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? Anybody know any good stories about the building here? Sure, go ahead. Uh, the book about Erdman is the only book about him in English. It was the very it was the first book about him. The book I wrote was it was published in 1992, and it was the first book about him. Uh, after that, uh, Andre Gotzis, uh, my colleague from Germany, 
published what is essentially a book. It's her dissertation, but German dissertations are are printed and sold as books too. So it's it's kind of a combination. Came out about a year or two after. No, actually, it was three or four years after mine did. And there have been several books written about him in Russian now, but they're all scholarly books. They're not biographies. They're you know analyses of his dramaturgy and his style and uh, that kind of thing. My book is a is a kind of a general book. It's a it's a book about it's a book about his literature, about his writing, about his art, but it's also a book about his life. Uh, so it essentially is the only book to, until to this date. It is the only book about him. That, that covers kind of all of those topics. I must say it's a really bad book. It's like anybody, if, if anybody has written books here, you know that your first one, you know, Pierwe Blin Komam. I don't know how to say that in English. Your first, your, the first pancake you make always comes out all smushed. Well, it's like that for writers too, you know, your first book is, is a mess. And uh, it's the one I love. I mean, I really love it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I have one copy. There's, I don't, I have one copy left. Um, and it sits there on my shelf, and I and I love it because it's a, an incredibly important part of my life. But uh, God, I wish I could do it again. I wish I could do it again with what I know now, and you know. And it's too late for me to do it now because so much has come out, so much has happened, so much has been written, so much has been discovered that for me to go back and write a book about him, I have to go back and just redo the whole thing again, and that, I, I I I can't do that. You know, I keep, I'm I'm in a whole different place now. So it's, it's a, uh, my book about Erdman, which is called Silence's Roar, The Life and Drama of Nikolai Erdman, is a, is a marvelous part of my life. I love it. It's one of the great successes and great failures of my life, all in one. And maybe that's the way things happen, too. <laughs> uh, there's a really bizarre, uh, the, to my knowledge, the, it's, all of the copies have been sold. You know, the publisher doesn't have any more. There's obviously there's copies out there in places. Uh, if you go on Amazon and try to find it, you can find copies for anywhere between $100 and $500. I don't know who in the hell these people are. Uh, I never got a pe I never received a penny for the book. The publisher never paid me anything. Um, and Mosaic Press Canada, by the way, if you're watching, you guys never paid me and you never even sent me the the author's copies. I had to buy copies to get copies. Um, I went on the net about a year ago and found four copies for $12 a piece, and I quickly bought them. So if you, you know, if you go on the internet from time to time, depending on what used bookstore gets some in, you know, somebody may sell them for cheap, and then somebody else who thinks that it's a really rare book and doesn't really know what they're talking about, they'll try to, you know, charge you $150 for it. I... I don't know what that's all about. It has nothing to do with me, of course. Um, but so there, there are copies out there, but uh, hard to find. There's a copy. I I uh, donated a copy to the the theater library here. There is a copy here at the theater library. Yeah, and I also donated a copy to the um, Mayerhold Museum on Brusev Lane, Brusev Pirulik. So there's two copies in Moscow. Well, there's one in my house. There's one at the theater library here. There's one at the Mirhold Museum. Uh, and I think that's it. So there's three in Moscow. A trinity, holy trinity. <laughs> Certainly, please do. Yes. I did see it. The question was about a production of The Suicide at the Yermolova Theater, uh, which is here on Tverskaya Street. It's just down at the very beginning, right next, right next to the Kremlin, actually. Um, 